Hello, everyone. My guest today is Jonathan Deutsch. He is the founder and lead developer of Tumult Hype. He's always had one foot in the programming world and the other in the visual arts. He previously was an engineering manager at Apple on various macOS projects. He was born in St. Louis, educated at Purdue, and now resides in San Francisco. Jonathan, are you ready to take us to the top? Absolutely. All right. Tell us about Tumult. What does it do and how do you make money? Okay. So um, our company was founded with the idea of doing tools for graphic designers to make animated web content. So we have an app called Hype, and it lets people range text, images, uh, video, and animate them with a um, keyframe-based timeline interface. And you can add interactivity. So when you click or drag, um, you can get all kinds of things to happen. Is this strictly mobile or is this web-based? So the application itself is a desktop application. It's for the Mac only, um, but its output is HTML5, so it can be used on phones, it can be used on desktop browsers. Um, you can also export to video, so in formats where you can't necessarily even play HTML, you can usually use Hype's output. Okay, and what's the revenue model? Are these one-time fees to download a license key, or is it monthly recurring, or what? Yeah, it's very old school, so um, we pretty much sell the software at, uh, for a one-time license, um, with the one exception being that we have a um, standard version and professional version. So we do a bit of price differentiation that way. So you can buy the standard version for $50. And if you want to do an in-app upgrade to get more features for an additional $50. Okay, got it. It's just one time. Just one time, yeah. Bootstraps. Uh, and when we do new versions, we'll do upgrade um, okay. charts like that. Like, so. like they have to repay the 50 or it's just incremental? Um, tip, well, so we've done different strategies at different points in time. So the last version, we said the standard version would be free if you were going from two to three standard, that's free, but then you pay for the pro version. The one we went from version one to version two it was you just had to pay it over again. And a lot of that had to do with the App Store model that the App Store doesn't really have a, uh, a way to do upgrade discounts, unfortunately. What year did you launch the company in? Uh, the very end of 2010. Okay. And where was your brain at that point? Was this like, uh, oh my God, I'm broke. I'm going to be on the street if I don't make the company work or you had plenty of money and savings and it was a great time to risk starting your own thing. Um, I had been working at Apple for a bit and had saved up um, a decent amount where I knew I wouldn't need to at least worry about the fundamentals for a while. Um, but of course you don't want to be in the weeds too long. So pretty much after launching, we were able to get version one out uh, within about like six, seven months of release and see how that would do. And luckily at the time, there weren't really the same tools for graphic designers um, to do animated web content. And so it just kind of struck a nerve with people and um, the launch went really well. And so that was able to see, oh, okay, this will be a successful business. Who is we, by the way, how many co-founders? Uh, so myself and I had one co-founder who is also a friend from Apple that left with me. Okay, you said had, is that person not with you anymore? Yeah, after four years, um, it was a good run, and he decided that he really enjoyed being at Apple again, so he went back. That stuff always sucks, but it happens, so I'm going to try and force you to talk about it so we can learn. Um, how do, <laughs> because this happens all the time. Nobody talks about it. How do you, first off, I imagine you, he had a large chunk of the company, right? Thirty More than 30%? Correct. Okay. How do you, when they say, when he comes to you and says, Jonathan... I just, I really want to go back to Apple. I liked my cushy salary there. I liked the salmon lunches and I liked the problems that we was working on. How do you get him out of the company, but try and keep some of the equity? Uh, so we did have a discussion about that and it really came down to the fact of, you know, if you're not going to be involved in the company anymore and he, you know, at that point wanted to go back to Apple, it was a matter of, well, I think this equity belongs <clears throat> with the company so we can use it for, <clears throat> excuse me, for, um, you know, paying employees in equity, for example, or doing other things with it. And, you know, I think four years is a really good run in a company, but over the lifetime of what hopefully is a very long lived company, um, the equity equation makes a little bit less sense at that point. And I think most founders over the course of time want to sell their share and convert it to money as well. So did he, um, he gave all the equity back? Uh, so we actually had a discussion about it and he agreed to do it. But um, due to the mechanics of how this is a little bit more of kind of a cash business, um, we actually didn't go through with the deal. So he still owns a percentage of the company. Okay, the same the same that you agreed on at the beginning? Correct, yeah, because it was basically a four-year vesting amount. And so he left um, pretty much after all the 
equity had vested. So, the, I mean, I'm sure you guys are friends, but this must be frustrating as hell for you because every day that you add incremental revenue, you're going, this guy's not even with me anymore. And every dollar I add to the business that increases the valuation by $10, he's basically getting $3 of doing nothing. I should just shut this down, go start my own thing with a clean cap table and start from scratch. How do you avoid that thinking? So part of it is the fact that um, we're a little bit more of a cash business. And so I think there is a point on, are we like a Silicon Valley business where we're really trying to build up the equity? And I think we've decided to go a little bit away from that and say that, no, we're more of a cash generating business and we'll do things like profit sharing. And so what is considered equity actually has a little bit less kind of importance and value in the company nowadays. If there were to be an exit event, um, that would be a different situation. Maybe that would be something where I go back and and talk with him um, because what we had said when he left the company probably you know is up for a little bit of renegotiation right now. How many uh, team members are there now? Uh, so right now there's pretty much myself and one other full time employee. Got it. And how many over the past what it would have been seven years, right? How many people have signed up for the platform? Uh, those are kind of numbers that we don't share, unfortunately. Are we talking though, like one hundreds, 10,000, a million? Uh, in the hundreds of thousands. Okay. In the hundreds of thousands. So we can say above a hundred thousand, but below a million. Is that a fair enough range? Yeah, I think that's a good okay. range. And that's over kind of total time the past, I guess, seven years, right? Correct. Okay. Why, um, tell me about the profit sharing. So when money does flow to the bottom line, do you still pay to people that have equity not inside the company or do you only do profit sharing with you and the one other team member you have? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's more of like a bonus structure is really what it amounts to. Okay, what I'm trying to understand is why you're okay with somebody else owning such a large chunk of the company. And what I hear you saying is, well, Nathan, he owns the equity, but we're not, this isn't a business we're gonna grow to 100 million and sell. It's actually making me X amount of money per month and I can control the cash flow to go into my pocket, so I'm happy. Is that accurate? <laughs> That's exactly right. Got it. So what do you do? You're a smart guy. You have this cash coming in. Where do you reinvest it? Like, do you put it in San Francisco real estate? Do you put it in cryptocurrencies? Where do you put it? Uh, typically, it goes either in the business somehow that I have progressively like enlarged our marketing budget, for example. Um, so that's kind of one area. I always feel like the company is the best investment because if I'm not investing in the company, then why am I even doing the company at all. all that I, I'm saying something else is a better investment. So maybe I should be set, spending my time there, but no, I'm saying my company is actually the best investment and that's what I want to do. And it's not just a, a monetary investment. It's also just a personal joy investment that the company is what I like doing. And the types of creations people make are something that I personally want to support. I kind of have a mission that I want to improve how people are creative in the world. And because I like art and I, I think that's something that's valuable to society. So there's no art on your walls, by the way. I'm so disappointed. You have these blank, <laughs> boring walls. <laughs> um, I do have one painting. Show me. On the floor. Go get it. Let's look at this thing. Uh, okay, right there it is. There. As it turns out, I just moved. So my apartment is extremely bare. Where are right you? Now. You're in San Fran, right? I'm in San Francisco. Yeah, if you were to. Tell me the price. Up. Tell me the price. How bad is it? What, what are you in a one bedroom and how bad is it? Oh, it hurts far too much to even think about it. <laughs> is it a one bedroom? It is a one bedroom. Is it above or below three grand a month? It is above. Oh my, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, you could live in a penthouse in Austin for that amount of money. I, right. I could do many things. Yeah, okay, three grand a month. Interesting. Um, some other questions here. So you said you, you reinvest a lot of this cash flow back into a marketing budget. What are you paying to get like one new customer using you? Um, so typically I would say, um, it can range on where I go, which is kind of the fascinating thing where sometimes it can be around a dollar or $2 to gain a customer. Um, and other things that have been perhaps less successful, it can be around $10. Why do you say a $10 CAC is unsuccessful when they're immediately paying you 50? Well, because there's not that much customer flow. And so there's a lot of other things to do with the money. It's not like it's $10 is the only cost there. There's development costs, um, support costs, things of that nature. But and it's so just you basically, right? I mean, there's one other salary in the company. Yeah. Yeah. What other, what other costs do you have besides you, whatever you want to pay yourself and the salary of the other person? Um, so at least we don't have a lot of like server infrastructure because it's a desktop application, but for the most part, running a business, there's just a lot of expenses, whether it's 
legal, whether it's um, space, uh, support is actually a pretty big cost in both time, hardware costs. Um, we do actually have a lot of different hardware that we need to test on. So all that, it, all that it kind of adds up. Mm-hmm. What will you, what do you spend monthly right now just on marketing budget? Are we talking 10 grand, a grand or a hundred grand? Um, in the like five grand range. Okay. About five grand per month. So anywhere between like 60 and hundred grand per year, you'd say? Yeah. Okay. How do you contact people once they download it via the app store and you're launching a new thing? Do you have their emails? Like, can you tell them and get ideas from them or no, that all has to go through Apple? So there's a few different ways. Um, so customer feedback's really important to us. And so there's a few different ways we get it. Uh, one, when you launch the app, we ask for an email address. It's totally optional. Um, if you want to provide that or not, but we also have what a percent give it to you. Uh, so that's actually really difficult to no, because we have a trial download. And so between a trial and a purchase, we can't exactly say um, what percent, unfortunately. Um, but I would probably guesstimate it's around 25 to 30 percent. But that's, you know, just me kind of guessing based on <laughs> how many how many new trials are you signing up right now per month? What's kind of like the rate? Um, I'm not sure what that data is. Like yeah. tens or hundreds or thousands? Um, per month, it would probably be thousands of people doing trials. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Cause you, um, what do you use like app Annie or something? Uh, so we have, um, because we're a Mac app, you can just download directly from our website. Um, and so there's various different channels where we have both a direct download version. We have sales through the Mac app store. There's another service called set app that we also sell through. Um, and then we also have like affiliated partners that will kind of redistribute our app a little bit. That's a smaller amount, but also, you know, just one way that we can't really track exactly how people are getting our app Mm -hmm. and people can rehost the download elsewhere. Also, have you, if someone came to you and offered you like two times, whatever your total lifetime sales have been for the company, would you sell two times? Probably not. Maybe three times. Okay. By the way, I'm assuming that's like somewhere between like five and 7 million based on at least a hundred thousand people paying 50 bucks. Is that generally accurate? It's a good ballpark. Okay. Got it. So if, if you're, if you've lifetime sales have been between five and seven, you're saying, oh, I wouldn't think about 10 to 14, but I would definitely think about like 15 to 25. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value, both product value, um, that we've developed over time where there's really been a lot of technology that's been developed into the application. I think that has, um, pretty good value. And, and also I, I enjoy, the company and the independence. And so there's, you know, always, always personal factors that come into play as well. There are. Yeah. I mean, you have a huge install base. I mean, you could have taken the approach of scale the team, add additional products, upsell the $50 people up to a hundred and five thousand, but you're in a peaceful room. You have your artwork, you control everything. There's cash flow. It's peaceful. You're good to go, right? That's how I see it. All right, Jonathan, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what is your favorite business book? Or book at all? Um, there is a book called, I believe it's called Dealers of Lightning. It's about um, creation of Xerox Park, uh, which is the Palo Alto Research Center. And so that was always an inspiration to me and in how you kind of make a team develop technology and do so in a very creative and innovative way and make that groundbreaking. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying currently? No. Number three, is there a fav- besides your own, is there a favorite online tool you have? Don't make one up. One you use every day. The one I use every day is desk.com. That's um, what we use for our support and it's what gets us customer feedback. So I think that's really useful. Number four, uh, do you, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Six to seven. Okay. And what's your situation? Married, single, do you have kids? Single. Sing, no kids that you know of? <laughs> no kids that I know of. <laughs> and how old are you, Jonathan? I am 35. 35. Last question. Take us back 15 years. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? I wish my 20-year-old self understood um, some of the value of how people interact socially. And I I feel like I spent a lot of time at the computer thinking that was, you know, what I loved and what I loved doing. And I I think, uh, you know, I wish I would have gotten out a little bit more and, and, and interacted with people. I mean, obviously every step gets you from point A to point B, but at the same time, I think there is a, 
a lot of good social interactions that I probably missed in college that I, I wish I would have had. And there you guys have it from Jonathan. He launched a Tumult. He wishes he really would have valued the uh, how people interact socially earlier on. But Tumult's having success. He launched it back in 2010. He's done between 5 and $7 million in lifetime sales on this app that really helps creators create more efficiently and more beautiful things. And that's really what gets him excited. He's managing the company based off kind of cash flow, which is a perfectly healthy way to grow a company and, and, and get yourself some success. So Jonathan, thank you so much for taking us to the top. Thanks for uh, having me be here.